corner to that also share, but that was over again. So anyway, so I want to thank you guys and, and City Swan Beach for hosting it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Greg, you can work ID. Um and so uh we'll have we need new attendance. We do. We have to test with the attendance. Go ahead. You do have a quorum. Um, I would love to do a roll call. Yeah. I am not, not signed in yet. So, <laughs> um, for the city of Imperial Beach, Mayor Chair Dadina. Uh, Dadina here. For the city of San Diego, Councilman Bill Lacava. Lacava here. The county of San Diego is absent. For the city of Carlsbad, Council Member Priya uh, Batkatel here. Um, for the city of Coronado. Is absent. City of Del Mar, um, the Mayor Warden. Here. City of Encinitas, Councilmember Hines. Here. City of Oceanside, Deputy Mayor Hines. Here. City of Solana Beach, Councilmember Becker. Present. City of Chula Vista, absent. And City of National City is absent. And that does confirm the form here. Great. 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 Then, um, Let's start. We have working group members can introduce themselves. You want to, I'm not sure where to start on this side, but working group members you want to introduce yourselves. That's you. Can. You want me to start? No, no, I'm yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. No, I guess the nine members of this table. Is that what we're, is that what we're asking? I'm going to show you to do that. Is that right? You can do that if you want to. You can okay, do that. Yeah, so nine, I guess nine voting working group members can introduce themselves. We just did a quorum call. Uh, I'm on the advisory board, advisory member for yeah, the Fire Foundation. So, Mitch Overstein, San Diego County, Policy Coordinator for Super Fire Foundation. Here. We're not working for the funders. We're on the advisory, I guess. Advisory member. Right now. I'm like Darren Smith with California State Park. Right. Mark Gonzalez, Coastal Environmental Rights Foundation. Anybody else? And then work. Go ahead. Oh, sure. So, Priya about Patel, uh, City Council, Carlsbad. And if you see me looking over that way, I'm just looking at the baby. So, <laughs> I'm going to be distracted by the baby the entire time. But nice to be here. <laughs> uh, Council Member Joel Ocava, I represent District 1, which is La Jolla North to uh, Carmel Valley. And I also sit on the San Diego Joint College Authority and San Diego Community Power. And all these other things as well, but I'm very excited to be here in person, I think, for the first time. Oh, good. Brian, can I motion site so you can? Courtney Pesh with Sandag. Third to you with IB. Dwight Word, Mayor, City of Del Mar, and I'm the newly appointed member to the League of California Cities Coastal Working Group representing San Diego. Um, I'm Kelly Hensey, and I represent the City of Encinitas. And since I've seen you last, I had baby Nakey, so this is Nakey, and she's here today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy Becker. I'm a council member from the city of Swan Beach. Hello, I'm Keith Greer. I'm Santa. I'm Eileen Maher with the Port of San Diego. Just at our end of the meeting. Great, thank you so much. And now we're going to start with non agenda public comments. Do we have any public comments of those from the public? I know we have people calling in. Do we have anybody calling in? Uh, I have one in person member of the public that would like to speak, Dr. Bailash. And then I'll check um, on the Zoom for. Oh, so do, I guess you're going to go ahead and call them if I can. This is fun filming. Right. Are we doing podiums or what are we doing? Yeah, yeah can you remember the podium? <laughs> Let's try to limit yourself to three minutes so we can get some meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, this is really sounds like a deep uh, working group and nice to be here. I live up in the hill and down there up on Race Track too. And uh, I've sent some things to San Diego over the past two months. Uh, I often go walking on the San Diego Lagoon, and I'd like to raise uh, two issues. The uh, liquefaction of the surface layer is extreme. If you walk along there, your feet will sink into the sand along uh, uh, Jimmy Durante as you go into town by the rail there. You'll see that one of the cliffs fell down under a house. We have the accident on the cliffs here. And I'm Clearly, we're not paying enough uh, attention to climate and the amount of water that is just coming down uh, and uh, not uh, and sinking into the soil and making it uh, slide. 
So I'd like to uh, bring it uh, again to our attention to think about it as we deal with the shoreline. The second thing is uh, the area of the double tracking that's coming off, I think might make a great preserve, a nature preserve for people. A lot of the people uh, outside this area come during the mornings, especially or evenings to take advantage of the wildlife. And I think it'd be a great opportunity educationally, but also experientially um, they're going to be changing, taking, I know, the uh, rail track and the 101 are going to be reorganized. So there's a lot about that, but I really want to bring it to people's attention because as I talk to people, no one's aware of what's going on. The problem is there are so many different agencies and cities, no one owns it. And the uh, Coastal Commission and other people, the, the uh, groups that I don't even know that make input into that. I just want to bring it to the attention of people here. I think that would be great. And um, I guess that's all I'm going to say today. Thank you. That's additional public comments. If you're a member of the public and you would like to speak on non-agenda public comments, please raise your hand at this time. There are none here. Great, thank you. And then do we have any comments from members of the working group? Okay, great. I know uh, Deputy Mayor Kent from Oceanside wants to give an update on the Oceanside project. Is that right? Yes. So okay. uh, our Coastal Zone Administrator, Jamie, is going to provide an update on the next steps. And... Hi there. I'm Jamie Timberlake. I'm the Coastal Zone Administrator for City of Oceanside. Um, thank you, Councilmember Kaim. And thank you to the working group for having me today. Um, I'll just provide you with a super brief update on our Coastal Zone Management efforts in Oceanside. Um, with regard to our sand nourishment and retention pilot projects, we have been and are currently refining the scope of work for phase two. We expect to take this contract to uh, council on January 25th. During this next phase, we will be exploring at least three hybrid sand retention approaches that afford multiple benefits, including rehabilitating lost natural resources. All the designs that come from phase two will have the goal of adding sand to the literal cell, which will supply us with added sand on a local and regional scale. We intend to closely coordinate with the region through this working group and through other outlets to make sure we're pushing forward with a pilot project that we can all learn from. This is our city's main coastal resilience effort, and we hope you will support us in January. And as always, I'm available for questions. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anything else? Uh, I just want to reiterate that um, we're very excited to have Jamie on board. This is part of our uh, regional approach. We really want to build a consensus and make sure everyone understands their next steps and um, ultimately come up with some solution that benefits the entire region that doesn't have any negative consequences. So again, as we go through this, um, it's very much a work in progress and we would like to hear any input, but you do again have our commitment that this, um, we intend this to be a regional um, project that uh, benefits all of our students. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And no, Keith, did you have some comments to make us speak there? I do. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you to Swan Beach for having us here. It's a wonderful location to host. Nice to know we got the ocean. We'll be talking about the ocean and we'll be looking at the ocean. So thank you. Um, please apologize for logistics. It's the first time we've had an offsite meeting in about four years. So we're still working this both in, in person and the hybrid world. Working with members, I failed to mention there's food up there and water. Please get up whenever you want to. Grab your sandwich, grab water. I'm um, looking forward to a good agenda today. I want to update you on two things. Uh, first of all, the MOUs. We've been talking over the last year about a regional beach sand project three. And we talked about the logistics of how that would look and work and possibly funding. And you remember back in, uh, I think it was uh, last spring, I talked about a two phase project as we've done in the past, where we do the first phase, we get the planning, the feasibility studies, the economic analysis done, and that makes us competitive for future grants, possibly from the state, which we'll hear about today, or federal funding. So the MOUs that we talked about last time we met um, have been drafted. Many registrants have already received an email from us with for consideration for signing up. And we're hoping that the jurisdictions will take that MOU, review it, ask any questions. Courtney or I would have to come to your council's uh, meetings. They have it. And sign them, and by this March, we hope to be into uh, getting a contractor on board and starting that work. So, if you have any questions about the MOUs, you can grab me after the meeting or afterwards, either Courtney and I can talk about that. The second most important thing happening today, probably the most important, this is our chair, Mayor Dedina's last meeting. So, he has been our chair for six years. He started in 2016, 
And we're very sad to see him leave, but happy to see him move on to his passion of environmental activism. And um, Mayor Nick, I want to have a little thought from the working group. Oh, well, can you come up here? Here we come up. Yeah, come on up. Okay, okay. Yeah. Class, we'll get party to take a picture for you. Yeah. So this is a little starfish on a plaque with Serge's name and the years he was the chair of the working group. And Courtney will take a picture of us. There you go. First of all, congrats. Okay, so I thought you had a free search for it. Okay, there you go. Okay. 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 So I just wanted to thank all of you. You know, when I think about, when I think about the work being done, and I've been really lucky to be involved in two committees in San Diego chair the Borders Committee, which is all about work. How do you put the quality of life people on the border with real infrastructure projects that actually make a difference? But also when I look around the room when I see a consummate professionals that are focused on work, collaborative consensus driven work. First, all the jurisdictions here are absolutely committed to public access and public recreation, right? Like that's sacred. And I, I really appreciate that ethic and ethos that permeates jurisdictions and agencies in San Diego and Southern California and California. It's very, very important. And you take that responsibility really to the highest level. Number two, I've been really impressed by not just the planning, but the action. When you look at what's going on with the Port of San Diego and Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and the city of Imperial Beach and San Diego, et cetera, et cetera, and South San Diego Bay, super innovative work, really important. I got to go out with Joe Ellis and Marathon and look at the new restoration work in San Diego. And then uh, Mayor Worden give a talk to us on the history of restoration efforts in San Diego. Absolutely phenomenal work, right? Super, really detailed, innovative, complex work that's actually being done. And we got to do a field trip to San, the San Alijo Lagoon project. And uh, again, super, really innovative, groundbreaking, important work, right? And I can go on and on and on about the work. And the folks at Audubon have gotten really smart and just called, called the Mission Bay Rewilding Project. They've gotten a, a sexy name, the work that a lot of us have been doing for a long time. We've been doing for a long time. But again, I wanted to thank you guys for being consummate professionals and focusing on how to get the projects done on the ground, work with the community. And more importantly, we figure it out. There's no longer the dichotomy between economic development and, and ocean and, and coastal protection. You guys have figured out how to protect and enhance the resource, enhance public access, and focus on making sure you have great and ancillary economic development. So it's a triple win. We are winning, but we just got to figure out how to get it done faster. <laughs> to get the permit flowing faster to get the, the, the good work done quicker. So with that, thank you guys very much. Under work with the staff and our chiefs and, and team and mapping research is doing really great work and really focused. There's no BS. It's like with chief, it's just like, how do we get work done? And I really, really appreciate that. So thank you very much. While the chair is getting settled in, I'd just like to state for the record that the Port of San Diego, I mean, Mayor. And Jessica Kerr and U.S. Navy are also present. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, now on to item three on the agenda, approval of September 1, 2022 meeting minutes. Tessa, do we have any public comments on this item? There are no virtual and no in-person public comments. There. Great. Do okay. we have any number of comments? Yes. yes. Um, I, this is on the meeting minutes, right? Um, I wanted to make sure that we um, changed that Dave Sego attended on my behalf. It says that he commented, but he was actually okay. a council member. We can definitely know that. Okay. So, do I have a, a motion to approve this item? As amended. Is there a second? Yeah. I'll okay. Second. Okay. Great. And please take the roll, council. And the roll call vote for item number three City of Imperial Beach, Chair Davina. Aye. City of Del Mar, Mayor Vice Chair Warden. Yes. City of Carlsbad, Council Member Bot Aye. City of Chula Vista is absent. City of Coronado is absent. City of Encinitas, Council Member Hines. Yes. 
City of National City is absent. City of Oceanside, yes. Deputy Mayor Fine. City of San Diego, Councilmember Lacava. Yes. City of Solana Beach, Councilmember Becker. Yes. County of San Diego is absent. Port of San Diego, Commissioner Mayor. Yes. Mayor. <laughs> and U.S. Navy, Ms. Perez. And that motion passes with um, all eyes that are present and one abstention. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and now on to uh, exciting stuff. Item number four, Division of Boating and Waterway with upcoming grant opportunities and Casey Caldwell with California State Parks will be providing an overview of upcoming grant opportunities. Casey. Yes, can you hear oh, me? That's right, that's right, you're uh, virtual. Okay, go ahead. They can you hear me, right? Yep. Very good. All right, Mr. Chair, congratulations and best wishes. Um, good morning to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. Courtney, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I know there are a lot of folks here who know me. For those of you who don't, it's great to meet you. My name is Casey Caldwell. I am a project manager at California State Parks Division of Boating and Waterways in uh, rainy downtown Sacramento. I have been uh, the program lead for the last eight years for our public beach restoration and shoreline erosion control programs. And these programs can provide local assistance grant funding to uh, public agencies that have identified a coastal erosion issue such as beach erosion and are seeking to plan or implement a solution that will benefit the public. I'm here today to provide a brief overview of DBW's coastal programs and then I can spend a few minutes answering questions if uh, your agenda allows for it. I know that your uh, agenda is packed today. So Courtney, Mr. Chair, I'll defer to you. Um, before I get into the details of our programs, I do want to emphasize DBW's general overall focus on public safety as we administer these programs. The list of laws and policies that are shown on this slide are only a sampling of the guidance we follow for our coastal programs. And this list doesn't even begin to get into topics like environmental compliance and permitting guidance that would be applicable to individual projects. From an overarching program perspective, a key consistent message in these listed laws and policies is the protection of public health and safety is the most critical factor that's supposed to guide DBW's approach to coastal protection. Safety isn't the only major project benefit that we pay attention to. Other important considerations include preservation of low-cost recreational opportunities, protection of fragile environmental resources, uh, the cost effectiveness of a proposed coastal erosion solution compared to potential alternatives, but you'll hear me talk about the safety aspects of projects frequently whenever I discuss these programs, because safety focused projects are the projects that are most likely to successfully obtain funding through our grant programs. So now on to the programs themselves. And the first one I'll discuss is the Shoreline Erosion Control Program. The state laws establishing this program allow a wide variety of coastal erosion solutions to be considered for funding through it. And that would include soft solutions like beach restoration, dune establishment, things like that as well as hard solutions like seawalls, breakwaters, groins, or potentially a combination of soft and hard solutions. And DBW can fund construction activities under this program, as well as pre-construction activities like engineering, design, um, permitting, feasibility studies, um, pretty much everything up to construction. Uh, DBW cannot fund long-term post-construction maintenance and monitoring, and we can't, uh, can't fund routine shoreline surveys that aren't being done in conjunction with a specific project. Those are um, more of local responsibilities. Um, going through a few more important details on this program, grant funding through the program requires a local partner to provide matching funding. Per statute and DBW policy, state funding sources can provide up to one half the non-federal share of costs or 50%. And if there is no federal funding involved in a project, the state can fund up to 50% of the project budget with the local partner covering the rest. There is no dedicated guaranteed state revenue source or funding source for grants under this program. The amount of funds available for this program can vary significantly from year to year, and there's no mandatory amount that any statute or regulation says must be devoted to this program. Thus, there's no preset minimum or maximum amount of grant funding that will be available through this program in any given year. There's also no preset minimum or maximum amount of grant funds available per project. In recent years, grant sizes have ranged from about $50,000 for feasibility studies to about $3 million for construction. Those really are just kind of guideposts. We don't have a hard cap or a, a minimum amount of grant funds that we can uh, allow per project. 
So the second program I'll discuss is the Public Beach Restoration Program. And this one's gonna be more familiar to this group because it's a DPW program that provided state support for the two prior regional beach sand projects back in 2001 and 2012. And this program has a narrower focus than the Shoreline Erosion Control Program. For a very specific statutory language, this program can only be used for activities related to the engineered placement of sand on the beach or in the near shore environment. In addition to construction phase work, DBW can fund project feasibility studies, pre-construction engineering and design, permitting, um, again, all the pre-project stuff. But again, we can't fund routine uh, beach condition surveys unless they're necessary for the construction of a specific beach restoration project. Local match contribution for the public beach restoration program is lower than that for the shoreline erosion control program. Uh, DBW can usually fund up to 85% of non-federal project costs with a local partner providing the other 15% as matched under this program. And this match can be provided either in cash or in pre-approved working kind labor. Uh, statute identifies the state's public beach restoration fund as the funding source for these projects, but there's no dedicated revenue source for the public beach restoration fund in state law. In the fiscal year 22-23 budget, current year state budget, there are three authorized projects totaling about $15 million that are funded through a transfer from the state's general fund to the Public Beach Restoration Fund. And one of these projects is the San Diego Shoreline Protection Project in Encinitas and Solana Beach, which received an $11.5 million funding authorization in this year's budget. While I'm on funding sources, um, some of you may be familiar with DBW's main funding source, the Harbors of Wondercraft Evolving Fund. And that fund does not fund project grants for this program or for the shoreline erosion control program. So part of the state's budget process for these coastal programs every year involves determining whether there's another available source of project funding, such as a general fund um, for the projects that we're proposing to move forward. Finally, the same case with the shoreline erosion control program, there's no preset minimum or maximum amount of grant funds available per project. As a reference point in recent years, project grant sizes have ranged from about $40,000 for pre-project studies to 11.5 million for the aforementioned project in Encinitas and Solana Beach. And this last slide I'm gonna show you um, is our timeline. One important consideration for public agencies in deciding whether to apply for grants through these programs is the timing involved. It's about an 18 month process from the time of grant applications to the middle to the official final determination of whether funding will actually be available through the state budget. Because we don't have a bucket of annual funding for these programs, every project has to be funded one by one through this state budget process, and that requires a lot of lead time. So the three key dates that I've bolded here are the opening of the application window, which took place in early November. December 15th is the application deadline, so it's a couple of weeks away. And then in June of 2024, about 18 months out, is when we expect the final budget to come out, and that budget will reflect any successful applications. Uh, do please note this timeline is always a bit tentative since the final budget in recent years has been subject to a, some additional refinement after the new fiscal year begins. But for DBW's programs, historically our budget allotments have been known and haven't really changed after that June date. So with that, um, my email address and phone number are here. I welcome any questions outside of this forum. And if time permits, I'm happy to take questions here. Um, so I appreciate your time. And Mr. Chair, I defer to you. Great, thank you so much, Casey. Appreciate that. And so, do we have any questions from the public or member our members? Uh, yeah, thank you, Casey. That's very interesting. Can you give us some insight? What's your track record in terms of getting actual projects funded in the state budget compared to the ones that you've recommended? So, part part of that question involves the confidential state budget process where there are projects that we move forward that might wind up not getting funded um, after they go through review by um, Department of Parks and Recreation, Department of Finance, other government agencies. It really is a long process with a lot of reviews. So um, without getting into detail, I can say that, you know, we have had meritorious projects that um, have wound up not being funded in recent years for whatever reasons. Um, but that's more of a recent phenomenon that thankfully um, changed over the last year when we did have the three projects that got funded through the general fund transfer to the PBRF. Um, so in the abstract, it's a little bit difficult to answer that, but um, we, I would say that you know, we're optimistic based on this past year and we're hoping for similar successful results going forward. 
Could I ask one follow up? Uh, this year, the state had about a hundred billion dollar surplus, and predictions are we're going to have a deficit next year. How are you looking forward to uh, funding for these kind of projects next year? It's a great question that I wish I had a firm, clear answer to. But you know, this program operates kind of, you know, in its own special place where you know, these are long-term projects that were that have long-term um, implications um, that might have a different perspective for the legislature and governor to look at um, compared to things that have more of a short-term immediate impact. You know, the the I think the Solana Beach project that we're looking at is a 50-year Army Corps project where the initial uh, construction phase um, culminates what's been a 20-year process to get to this point, right? So, you know, looking at individual years from one year to the next, there's, there have been different budget circumstances throughout those 20 years where there's still been funding available for this particular project. Um, so the concern is certainly one that we share, and the curiosity is one that we share, but it's just really impossible to predict given the, the way that the, um, the budget is constructed based on a variety of factors that frankly I don't have a line of sight to. Thank you. Great, thanks. Additional questions, Jeff. One quick question, Casey. Um, if a project just has, um, has a sand nourishment component to it, is there a way to get funding for just that component of a project? For only the construction phase, you mean? I, can you repeat that? Are you talking about only the construction phase or I'm misunderstanding your question? No, sorry, no if we have a project with, with, and part of it has sand nourishment in it. Mm -hmm. Is it grant funding for just the sand nourishment part um, separate from other parts of a project that we may be uh, studying? So if I'm understanding your question correctly, the sand nourishment's one component of maybe a four component project that involves placing a riprap or uh, extracting a brick water. We could fund strictly that sand um, nourishment part if it met the parameters that we would normally look at as far as protecting public property and uh, protecting public safety, things like that. Thank you. Additional questions from members of the public or any, just any, any questions on, online? I don't have any virtual public commenters and I don't see anyone here as well. Anyone else? All right, great. Well, it's a great project, Casey. Really glad it's back, hopefully, for us. And um, looking forward to seeing how we can move that. Very good. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, good. Okay, thanks. With that, we'll move on. And uh, this is an information item only, no action required. So next up, we have item five, and that's the Encinitas Solana Beach Coastal Storm Damage Reduction Project. And some of you recall that this project was presented at the September 1 uh, meeting. Uh, City Manager Greg Wade, Leslie, uh, Leslie Meyerhoff, and the U.S. Army Corps Engineer staff are here today to provide a status update on the project and answer any questions members have. Uh, we're on a tight schedule, so if you have lots and lots and lots of questions, we can do it after the meeting in this wonderful space overlooking the beach. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. I don't know if you're true. I'm not Greg Wade, as you can tell, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm Susie Meng. I'm from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and I'm the project manager. I know a lot of your faces, but I haven't seen them in a long time. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I will just keep to the recap from uh, since September uh, 1st. Um, there's a lot going on, and it's kind of an exciting time for us. There's a lot of moving pieces. Um, we had a lot of comments and questions from the last September meeting. Um, we put together some responses. I think those are in your packet. Um, and we're happy to further talk about any of those. Um, we initiated uh, our one year of pre-project monitoring. That's uh, part, and it's a lot of different pieces to it, but one is surfing monitoring. Uh, we have six locations, three in Encinitas and three in Solana Beach. The three in Encinitas are surf line um, uh, cameras and the three in Solana Beach were installed specifically for this project. Um, I'm not gonna go into details, but we certainly have a lot of details we can share. Um, the city of Solana Beach held a meeting with the city of Del Mar staff to discuss the project initially. Uh, we also met as a team with Los Angeles Lagoon uh, in talking about shoreline transects and where they would want those, uh, some input from their team, because um, they've done a lot of work in the past. We want to make sure we're trying to uh, get their input. Um, we established two new shoreline profile transects. I will say one is um, old, but it had not been done before. It was done in the sand transects, uh, but we reestablished it. 
um, as because it also has some historical data, so that's really beneficial to us. And then we reestablished we established a new one, North and West Panacea Lagoon, over near where the um, lagoon managers had already had one. But this one goes out much further. Um, and I know um, Greg Heron is going to talk after me, and he's going to talk all about the monitor. And so I'm not going to go into detail about that. Um, we conducted outreach to the San Diego Lagoon managers. And uh, we held a meeting with Sir Carter Foundation, talked to them about our program, our plan, and the data that we're going to get. So there wasn't anything that came out of it except to share the data that's ongoing. Next, please. Um, since our meeting in November, uh, September, we have uh, started that pre-project monitoring. A lot of the fall data that Greg will talk about was completed, that first set. Um, we'll we did 21 transects. It said like some of them were being done for Sandag, some of them are being, being done by the cities, and some of them are being, being done just for this project. So it's really a conglom conglomeration of transects. Um, we will redo all of those transects in the spring, and then we we'll do them uh, post project monitoring as well. So we have that requirement in our project. Uh, we completed barocyte benthic sampling and water quality sampling. We completed aquatic terrestrial biological resource field surveys, and actually, I think that round did uh, uh, finish up like maybe last week, or maybe it's still ongoing. But we'll have all that data, and we'll redo a lot of data in the spring, as we said. So that will establish our baseline, right? So once we have our project, we have post-project monitoring, and we'll be able to determine what, if any, impacts from our project. And one of the things I know has come up at the last meeting was lagoon uh, impacts and concerns, and so we have a meeting coming up, and I think next week week after with all the lagoon managers so we can discuss what the plan is and, and what our project entails. Sorry. Next slide. Um, we are working to incorporate our project with our Portland District's West Coast Copper Bridge contract. It's a way to enable us to use the equipment that will hopefully be here on the West Coast. We'll be able to have some cost savings, which is something that's really important to us. Um, we anticipate if we get everything in line, and I say there's a lot of moving pieces uh, to have construction in the fall through the winter of 2023, 2023 to 2024. Um, there's also a project that you probably know of in San Clemente, which is a shoreline project, um, and that will probably be bundled with this one. Probably before they'll come down to San Clemente first, and then do these two projects here, these two project sites. Um, as I said, this really is kind of a win-win for us. Uh, the core, if we're able to uh, have some cost savings with our Portland district, they have an O&M contract, operation maintenance uh, work that needs to be done every year. So we will hopefully be able to save on mode demo, but it's not um, insignificant the amount of cost to mode and demo uh, uh, copper drives to the West Coast. And um, I think Greg talked about this last time, but um, Encinitas is renourished every five years, and Solana Beach is set to renourish every 10 years. So the idea would be to sync up those renourishments every other cycle. Um, and uh, next slide. So I'm not going to go over these too much, but we have a lot of environmental commitments. Um, we have them outlined in our integrated feasibility report, our EIS, EIR that's available online. Happy to provide that to you, but it has a lot of pre-project monitoring, during construction monitoring, and post-construction monitoring. So I'm not going to go through all these because some of them are pre-projects, some of them are during construction, like snowy clovers, um, random monitoring. But we have completed at least that first half of the pre-project monitoring. Next slide. Um, and this just talks more about what we're doing. As you said, we have the surfing monitoring plan. Uh, that we're working on. Um, we have the bar site data that we did, our sampling and analysis plan that's um, available as well. And a lot of the other plans we'll be putting together over the next six months as we work towards uh, construction. Um, I'll note that I also have um, with me, I know that you don't have many time for question for questions, but I have Caleb Lodge, who's our lead coastal, en coastal engineer. Larry Smith is on the line and our city partners. Um, and then Greg, uh, Heron and Coastal Frontiers is our lead um, contractor on all our pre-project money. So I hope I kept it short and sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Like I could I put it yeah. one thing yeah. thanks to the uh, great way the city of Solana Beach. Uh, it was on the presentation, but this is the, the last meeting. We also presented to the, the Delmar City Council. Uh, several comments came up at the last meeting. We, present, we presented this to Sandag uh, from council members, Terry Gastelman, as well as the uh, Vice Chair Warden. Uh, we presented the full council. There was good dialogue about our questions, and so that was something we did. And we're we're continuing our ongoing uh, 
uh, coordination with uh, staff at the city of Del Mar. Great, thanks. We have just a few minutes. So, Councilor, any, any questions from the public? Or... I have no public comments. Any working group or people in the audience questions? Great. Well, thanks a lot. It looks like you guys are doing a lot of a lot of work, a lot of work done. So, I appreciate that, and um, look forward to seeing how this project rolls out. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. And that's an discussion item only, no action required. And now we'll move on to item number six, uh, an ongoing presentation that we have here in the Regional Shoreline Mon Monitoring Program annual report. Um, and Greg Kieran will go to Frontiers Group and present the 2021 Regional Shoreline Monitoring Program results. And with a focus on the monitoring reform in the city of Swanee. Thanks, Greg, for being here. Thank you. So today I'm going to update you on the state of the code um, based on last year's monitoring program. So we'll be looking at results through fall 2021. 2022 surveys have been conducted. It's having a process. So we'll we'll talk about that um, when we meet next time. Uh, apologies ahead of time. I can tell you're already going to have trouble seeing some of these um, with the size and, and the angles. But I, I believe you post these on the uh, website. Okay. Excellent. Next slide, please. Um, so I know there's often new new attendees or members of the working group, so bear with me. I'll provide you a little bit of background information to lend some context to the results. And then um, we all, often just talk about beaches um, when we get together for this, but I would like to touch on lagoons a little bit today. And then focus in a little bit on Solana Beach, our host city, and uh, some of the, the outcomes at, at this location and the monitoring that they've been doing over the last couple of decades. And then again, as Susie said, we'll, we'll um, summarize the pre-project monitoring conditions for the Corps of Engineers um, project that we're conducting with Merkel and Associates. So we have a, the biologist that's gonna be able to answer all those questions that I can. Um, next slide, please. So we have um, the study area extends from the Oceanside Harbor to the US-Mexico border, includes portions of three littoral cells. And for the purposes of analysis, we're going to divide these literal cells up into some sub reaches based on geographic municipal boundaries. Um, so, Oceanside, North Carlsbad, Mission Beach, um, Imperial Beach, for example. Next slide, please. So, the objective of the, the program, which has been going on for about 26 years now, is to measure changes in the shore zone so we can evaluate the impact of human intervention, such as the regional beach sand project and natural events like an El Nino. Um, we have a lagoon entrance component and a shoreline of beach component. Next slide, please. In terms of lagoons, we're looking at five sites in the ocean side cell. Two are um, have stabilized entrances, that's Agua Hedianda and Vadaquitas. Um, Vadaquitas in the upper right, which is very washed out, anybody can't see. Um, three unstabilized entrances, San Alijo, San Diego and Los Pena's Quitos. And the metrics that we're keeping track of is percent of time during the year that the lagoons are open to tidal exchange, the closure frequency, the opening frequency, the maintenance dredge volumes. And then sand deck personnel also goes out monthly and takes uh, photos from repeatable locations at each of the unstabilized lagoon entrances. And all of this information, with the exception of those photos, is gathered from the various lagoon entities or some other consultants like Coastal Environment. So without their cooperation, we wouldn't be able to compile all of this data. The beach monitoring portion consists of uh, beach profile surveys. We have 57 sites at this point, again, from the side down to the US-Mexico border. Surveys are conducted in the fall and spring, corresponding to the beginning end of the winter wave season. So we would expect to see our widest beaches in the fall in our narrowest or among our narrowest beaches in the spring after a winter wave season. Um, we do the surveys from the back beach out beyond the depth of closure. So that we recall that depth of closure is the point in which waves and currents typically are moving sand around much more. It's the outer boundary of what we call our literal system, our literal zone. So our surveys most typically go out to 40 or 50 feet of water. The depth of closure is, is typically shallower than that. Uh, so the beach profile is essentially a cross section of the beach. I know this is hard to see, but this is uh, several profiles at um, Moonlight Beach, just up up the road. One more click, and it will show a close up. 
closer up on the beach are all the actions happening. But from these profiles, we can get mean sea level beach widths and shores on volumes. So that shores on volume is the calculation of the material in the profile all the way out to that depth of closure. So we're trying to capture all the material that's in our literal system. Next slide, please. Um, you're all familiar with the regional beach sand projects, I believe, um, conducted in 2001 and 2012, providing about 3.6 million cubic yards of material to the system. Um, there's also been numerous opportunistic pro, uh, projects during the past two decades. Recall these are projects whose primary purpose wasn't necessarily beach building, but had a component that ended up placing material on the beach. Uh, some of the larger ones, for example, are dredging in San Diego Harbor, which finds its way onto Imperial Beach, Mission Bay dredging, and most recently the San Lijo Lagoon Restoration Project, which provided material to Cardiff and right here at Solana Beach. Next, please. Last year in review, we had one opportunistic nourishment project conducted here in Solana Beach, actually, 21,000 cubic yards. We had our typical sand bypassing occur at Oceanside Harbor, Agua Hedionda, San Alijo Lagoon, and Los Pinasquitos Lagoon. Um, environmental conditions, we had below average precipitation again, which leads to below average stream flow and potential for delivery of natural sediment to the coast. Um, in terms of waves, we had below average wave frequency and persistence of, of storm waves. And one notable event was about corresponded to about a six year return period. Next slide, please. Okay, it's hard to read and a little washed out, but here we're just uh, providing a summary of the lagoon entrance condition results. So, looking at some of these various metrics in the pre RBSB period and the post RBSB period. Now, each of these lagoons has a very different story and sometimes a detailed story with the outcome uh, driven not only by natural events, but by human intervention, how often things are dredged or the desire to keep lagoon entrances open and whatnot. But my main point today here was to, to re-familiarize yourself with the type of information that we're compiling and where it can be found in the annual report so you can dig into each of the lagoons and, in more detail if you, if you wish and when you wish. Next slide, please. Back to beaches. So we're gonna talk about the current condition of the beaches, where we are today, and touch a bit on the evolution of how we got to this point. Uh, we'll talk about the sub-reaches that we, that we discussed earlier, and we'll be looking at the, at the uh, beach condition in terms of beach width, shore zone volume. Again, that shore zone volume is the amount of sand out to the depth of closure, the full amount of material in our literal system. Next, please. Okay, this is completely watching out. <laughs> it's the it's ocean side cell, and uh, it's the 2021 beach widths in, in uh, fall and spring. And what you can't see is that there's there's a gray band on that that's showing the range of, of beach widths that have been measured, the historical envelope for the last two decades. And what I wanted to show you here is that in most places throughout this region, we're kind of in the middle or lower part of that historical range. Okay, so we're kind of at, at the bottom end. There's a couple exceptions like Solana Beach, for example, and, and that's due partly because they've got this extra plug of material from the, the, the San Alito project. Um, next slide. So again, you're not going to be able to see it, but the 2021 beach widths all kind of fall in the middle of this historical range or envelope of beach widths that we've measured over the past few decades. Next slide, please. And walk out again, but um, now we're going to look at net changes in beach width and shore zone volume from uh, 2000 to 2021. 2000 is the pre regional beach sand one condition. So, before we started with all of this active management of the beaches, so we have this is the ocean side. So, can I get one more click? It'll, it'll, there you go. Um, red is indicating erosion or losses, green is indicating gains. Beach width on the left, towards on volume on the right. And this is the ocean side cell. And you can see that the red is, is really outweighing the green for much of the region, particularly with beach widths. But we have a couple of area, isolated areas where we, we maintain these long term gains. That's um, North Carlsbad to the north, and then Cardiff 
Swan Beach in the southern part of the region. And again, part of the Swan Beach is attributed uh, a lot to the, the extra flood material they got. When we look at shores on volume, we see similar pattern, but we've been, been able to maintain or track more of this um, sand in, in the full system from Cardiff down actually into Del Mar as well. Next slide, please. So now uh, we're going to look at again net changes, beach width, and shores on volume in the Mission Beach and in Pure or in Silver Strand Cell. And again, the takeaway here, I know it's hard to see, but there's more red than green. So we're, we're kind of worse off or below the, the pre regional beach sand one condition throughout much of the region. Next slide. Okay, so let's on this table, we're going to take the information from that graphic and put some numbers to it for each of the sub regions. Mm -hmm. so that part where, we, where you find the beach that you're interested in, you see how it's done. So, again, sub reaches from north to south on the left hand side. Average beach width change and average shore zone volume change relative to the pre regional beach sand one condition. You can see in most cases the number tracked pretty well, ocean side. Uh, 44 feet narrow or in beach width and 38 cubic yards per foot um, less in the shores on volume. And then you can see these, these uh, spots that had these long-term gains, North Carlsbad, Solana, and Cardiff with, with the gains as much as uh, 96 feet wider in some cases at Cardiff, or I'm sorry, at Solana Beach. Next slide, please. So as important as where we are today is how we got here, how the, the beaches evolved to this um, condition, given that we've had several nourishment projects. So this is an example, and this is in the ocean side sub region. We're looking at, again, very washed out, but it's um, mean sea level beach widths in blue and shore zone volumes in red, the time series of those relative to the nourishment condition. And so you can see when the first project went on the beach here in 2001, you have several years of gains afterwards until you drop down below the, the heavy line, which is the pre nourishment condition. Now, if you recalibrate yourself to calling 2011 the pre RBSP2 condition, you can see we had gains right after that project that were maintained for several years, and then we kind of fall back off into the, uh, into the pre condition. So if we go to the next slide, there's there's figures like that for every one of the sub reaches in the report. So you can find your city in there and track how it's done. But just for today, I put together a table that's just say, let's calculate the number of years or tally up the number of years after regional beach sand one and a regional beach sand two, where we had wider beaches and more sand in the system. So the, we're looking at beach width and short of the volume, RBSP one. The left, left side, RBSP2 on the right. So there's a maximum of 11 years for RBSP1, 10 years for RBSP2. So ocean side, like we saw in the previous figure, lasted for five or six years after the first project. The second project, the beach, the beach width lasted for about seven years, but the shores on volume, we weren't able to keep, keep in the system very long. So again, North Carlsbad, part of Salon are the ones that have those really long periods, 10 and 11 years where, where the material is stuck around for a long time and providing those benefits. So I would encourage you to go find your city in the report, find that figure, and you can kind of track and see how, how it's done. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about our host city, some of the monitoring that they've been done and doing and some of the outcome here in this region. Talk about the shoreline monitoring program, documentation of bluff conditions, and some UAV or drone based beach surveys that have been conducted in the area recently. Next slide. So, the city of Solana Beach conducts a shoreline uh, monitoring pro program in conjunction with Sandag. So, essentially, they're, they're sponsoring several transects. San Sandag has a transect, one in this area at Fletcher Cove. The data are here to <laughs> provide more focus in the city and also. More information for the region. The uh, city of Carlsbad conducts a similar program as does the city of Vitas. Um, so there's four transects in the area conducted at the same time as Sandac. Next slide. So on this figure, we're looking at beach widths at Fletcher Cove, just down below us. It's the oldest or longest running transect in the area. So we have data back to the mid 90s. The solid markers here are showing the fall beach condition, the hollow or the spring. So we have this sawtooth pattern of wider beaches in the fall, narrower in the spring. 
And I've, I've noted the timing of regional beach sand one, two, and the San Alijo Lagoon project. And as you see those projects go in, you see the stair step of each woods going up and being maintained throughout the period. So currently we're about 100 feet wider at Fletcher Cove than we were in the mid 1990s before we started actively managing the beach with regional beach sand beyond two and these other opportunistic projects. Next slide. So the city is very interested in, in the bluff condition given that that feature dominates the coastline here. So in 2016, uh, we did a high resolution LIDAR scan of the bluff face. The intent being that's going to serve as a baseline and maybe every decade or so go back and do a similar scan and document uh, the amount of retreat or erosion that's occurred on the bluff. Uh, as part of that effort, we also developed the GIS database to characterize bluff conditions. And within that is um, all of the bluff failures. So the city's done a great job of uh, documenting bluff failures over the years. It just wasn't in a place where it was easily acceptable, like a GIS database. So now that's all in a database. So you can look at bluff failures by location, by time, and start to correlate with things like, can I, can I match this up to a big wave year or a heavy rain year? And the answer is no, because it's such a complex process. But, but we've run through that exercise, and, and we can kind of keep track of, of where all of this is happening. Um, next slide, please. Um, there's also been numerous um, UAV or drone based surveys of the beach conducted here at Solana and off the heart of this part of the SWERP project. So that's using a drone to, to get high resolution imagery of both with, and with photogrammetry. We can develop a, a very detailed topographic map above mean sea level so we can track shorelines over a wider area calculate volumes above mean sea level, things like that, and also get sort of a qualitative look at the bluff condition along the way. And that work's conducted for the San Olivo Lagoon Restoration Project. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so circling back to, or did I miss one that was at the conclusion site? Okay, so where are we? We put about 5 million cubic yards of sand on the beach in the last two decades. As far as the beaches are, in most places, we're at or below the pre-regional beach sand one condition. So we're back to where we started from. There are some exceptions, Solana Beach, Cardiff, and North Carlsbad. And again, Solana Beach and Cardiff got that extra flood of material four years ago, whereas regional beach sand two, again, was about a decade ago. We had some the least favorable, favorable outcomes in places like South Carlsbad, where we just weren't able to hold any sand there for very long. So the, the outcome did vary by location. And that's attributable to you know, how big was the regional beach sand fill? Were there any opportunistic earth been done along with it, like the slurp project? And then interaction with adjacent fills. Like we see the uh, ocean side fill moving into the um, North Carlton area and extending the life of the, the fills and, and the benefits in that zone. And then some of these areas just tend to have um, characteristics that tend to com compartmentalize or retain sand a little bit better. So. At Cardiff, for example, that's somewhat crescentic shoreline down by the uh, lagoon delta on the north and and um, the reef, tabletop reef on the south, it just seems to hold sand a little bit better. North Carlsbad with the Agua Hedy and Hedy on the jetty seems to hold sand a little bit better. Um, next slide, please. So circling back to the U.S. Army uh, Corps of Engineers project that Susie presented. Um, you mentioned we're conducting a pre-constructed monitoring right now. Um, we're doing that in conjunction with Merkel and Associates, who's the project biologist. There's four main elements. It's a physical monitoring element, and that's essentially what we just talked about: the beach profile surveys, the lagoon conditions. And as Susie mentioned, we've added several more transects to get, to get more resolution in the area. And then there's a habitat monitoring element consisting of rocky reef, intertidal, and seagrass components. A borrow site monitoring element where we're looking at uh, seabed changes at the borrow site, water quality, and benthic habitat. And then there's a surf zone monitoring, um, which is basically surfing conditions that, that Susie mentioned as well. Both of those being conducted in this fall and next spring in projects like the surf zone, surf zone monitoring, and that's all, all year round or this entire one year period. Next slide, please. So in terms of habitat monitoring, um, 
We're working between Botticitas Lagoon in the north and the south portion of the um, city of Solana Beach. The photo on the upper left, which you can't see, is from about a week ago. Um, surf craft during one of the dive, the dive transects. Um, which you can't even see even more is intertidal transects on a tabletop reef. And then in terms of borrow site, the borrow site off of Del Mar. And again, you can't see it very well, but it's just showing the shape of the borrow sites and some of the sampling locations for water quality and habitat. Next slide. Uh, surf monitoring. As Susie indicated, we're, we're gathering the baseline condition data now, looking at six sites, uh, Ponto, Moonlight, Swamis, Hyde Park, Fletcher Cove, and Del Mar Shores Parish in the southern part of the city here. Video-based observation, three are publicly available surfline cameras, three were installed and maintained specifically by the city of Solana Beach for this project. We're conducting um, the observations for a one-year period twice daily at uh, seven in the morning and one in the afternoon. And we're reporting uh, metrics such as uh, wave height, wave period, wave direction, uh, surf quality on a one through 10 type scale, uh, tide, water level, and crowd count. So we'll have this twice a day, every day, at these six sites for a full year before the project goes up. Last slide. I know that was a lot of information. It was hard to see that, but it's fair and fair and regular. Thanks, Greg. Really, really important work and important inclusive work. Appreciate that. Um, are there any testimony public comments first? We do have one in-person public commenter, Dr. Bailat. You want to just, well, actually, this maybe just we're not standing. We're not recording. Just stand there, then you can then Greg can answer. If you have comments, right? Okay. I, I, I think it's like to take a minute if I could. My name is Dr. Timothy Bailash. I live up here in Del Mar. I am a uh, scientist and a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. I appreciate the efforts of the community and especially the comments made about Sandeg. I really, really admire what everybody's doing. Um, I, uh, I've had the privilege of living in many coastal areas. I grew up in Long Island. Um, on the coast there, we went to the beach. I was down in Florida quite a bit. And now I'm here with my family. And uh, seeing this progress from sand washing away to putting up levees out there on the East Coast, so all the different types of things, I just want to remind us a little bit um, to tie to climate change because we're not really taking it seriously, in my opinion. And we can mitigate all we want, but uh, the reality is you can't fill up the ocean with sand no matter how hard you try. And the nice, uh, beautiful monitoring that's being done shows that the sand collects in some places and goes to other places. So this is a dynamic uh, problem. Uh, the, um, there's a, uh, a, an old a legend about Zeus, and I believe Thor was supposed to drink out of a chalice. And he was only able to, I believe, uh, empty it like half an inch because it was tied to the oceans of the world. And it's hard to get that perspective and to communicate it to people that are outside this area. One of the issues, it's not just the mean water that's coming up, but it's the high to low and the, and the quickness of how that changes that causes this coastal erosion. On the East Coast, they dealt with erosion. Here we're dealing with something even worse, which is the amount of water that comes down on the land that adds to the uh, to the volume of, uh, of soil flow. Uh, Sunday just happened on one of the local San Diego uh, TV shows. They did a highlight. I forget which channel it's on, but it, you know, old San Diego. It used to be a um, airfield in the San Diego Lagoon. They highlighted. That's how much the water has risen. And now we're trying to dig channels out and to put sandbars to try to block these things. And if this could be some way of connecting the work that's being done here to demonstrate to people, hey, you know, it's too late. We should have done this years ago. So what, what are we going to do about that aspect of it? The funding for the projects that are gonna keep the water out of the atmosphere because what goes up comes down and it comes down too fast. 
Two more comments and I'll, I'll finish. Um, this problem is not local. It's all along the coast. It's all along all of the coast. And the more that we can do to share the information and the data that's collected that's pertinent to the other things, I think would be helpful. We are not taking this seriously in my opinion. I'm a physician and I have a saying, to some degree in the hospitals I feel we're getting better and better documenting. I'll just take yeah. one second how we're getting the patients getting sicker. So please continue what you're doing, but find some way to make this real for us that we give the funding and that we don't wait another 50 years before we are where we should have been. Great, thank you very much, appreciate that. Any other questions? There are no further comments. Remember comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation. And I know we've gotten um, updates on this uh, over the years that I've been on this particular committee. I was just curious, you know, obviously I see the least favorable outcome at South Carlsbad and I represent that area. Um, I grew up going to what, you know, whatever beach there really was in that particular area. So I'm just curious, you know, obviously with the least favorable outcome being there and obviously um, seeing what happened post the RBSP one, um, I'm just curious what we're planning to do, you know, in terms of addressing that area specifically. Well, I think that's partly up to the city yeah. and Sandag, but mm -hmm. yeah, you could you could change the way you're doing some of the bypassing at Arbor Hedionda. Of course, it's going to be taking sand from one place to another, but it also might be an area that that um, would benefit from some sediment retention. Mm -hmm. Depending on what some of the other environmental constraints might be, but that could be something to consider. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, question. Uh, one, I love the data driven approach. This is hugely valuable information. Have you compared these data to data from another beach that hasn't received retention over the 20 year time period? Yeah, that hasn't received sand? Yeah. What I'm getting yeah. at is, Given that we've done all 5 million cubic yards in 20 years and we're kind of back where we were with some localized exceptions, is that because we've prevented 10 steps backwards and it was worth it? Or are we just being overwhelmed by nature? It's kind of hard to say. See, I mean, with, by, with sand nourishment, it's as we've talked about in the past, it's maintenance. It's not necessarily a capital project that's going to last forever. And you're trying to um, compensate for the sand that you're no longer getting naturally. Right. And then as far as looking at beaches that have received nourishment and have not, in this area is, is really hard to do because we hit eight beaches in, in the ocean side cell, and that cell works as a as a much larger unit. So you know what goes in at ocean side is going to affect North Carlsbad, and what goes in at South Carlsbad is going to eventually go down and start impacting um, Encinitas and whatnot. So it's it's hard to find that control site to say, well, if we wouldn't have done anything, this is what would have happened. Because it's it's also interconnected once we start putting sand on the beach in these cells. All right, thanks. Additional questions, comments from anybody? Um, I, sure, sorry, go ahead, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I had a question about the uh, flow of sediment. Uh, it seems to me that it's generally accepted that sand was south, but uh, it also seems to me that there's a significant contribution of sand moving really north. Now, I'm wondering if you can comment on that and uh, how that varies. Yeah, so that, that's one thing that makes um, this coast very interesting and actually hard to, to do modeling and predictions on because there's an enormous amount of sand moving from north to south and also from south to north, depending on, on the uh, time of year. But it's, in general, it's, the net is to the south. Or if you go to a place like uh, Santa Barbara County or West Newport Beach, it's moving south and there's not a whole lot going the other direction. So it's really, really a hard place to get a handle on the processes because the total of material is moving both north and south. Is there some sort of equalizing effect because it moves both both directions? Equalizing in what term? And, and what term? Yeah, as far as you know, the beaches remaining, uh, there's not a whole lot of sand necessarily moving one direction or the other because it, it moves back and forth. It, it does, but it, you know, if you follow one grain of sand, eventually it's going to end up down in La Jolla from ocean side. You know, it's going to kind of do this thing seasonally and, and, and work its way down. There are times when there's annual reversal. Doug Inman's documented that um, as part of uh, some earlier studies where like, it 
say you get a, a switch in Pacific decay to oscillation, you have more southern hemisphere energy. Might for a, a one year net might go the other way, but generally do so. Thank you. What's clear though, and I be from you know, what we've seen in the scripts could correlate this because they do all the modeling. You really see, like the last sand project, you can really see that sand in the north. You know, we get a lot of south winds, and it's a very interesting literal south. Um, you know, just that constant long short current from south north, even in the winter when we have south wind, and now we have south swell. So, anyway, so that's interesting. Okay. That's a good point. It's yeah, different down there. Oh, it is. Yeah, and it is here and here. It's like so yeah, for, and then for a variety of reasons. So I know that scripts. I think you did the lidar work on the block, block class, you know, block monitoring and scripts. I'm not sure if that's the same tools that scripts was using, but are there like sensors or you know, like with earthquake monitoring that you got, you know, people are you know, have technology that can actually you know do real time monitoring of what's happening. So what's happening on the block? I would imagine there probably are. I'd be afraid to put too much stuff in the block, and maybe it's right, it's fall too. But, uh, it's the same type of LIDAR technology that Adam was using. Right. Can I comment on that, sir? Uh, the Contra Born Horvath dish spots are a bill that got passed, and Scripps got some grant money, I think $5 million, and they're doing inclinometers and trying to get a handle on can they predict when bluffs are going to come in. And that's the target area they're doing that in Delmar and also, I think, in the Yeah. Great. Well, that's, I think we're out of time. So, uh, any, any more questions for Greg or comments can be at the end, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for joining. Thank you, Greg. You know, as well, information, uh, information item only, no action was required. And now we have a super awesome project in IB with our great team. Actually, this is a very cool project. Um, but I'm biased. <laughs> um, and this item number seven, the Bayshore Bike Way the Jonesy Project, the city YB staff and the consultants are here to present the plan for repurpose the 1.2 mile segment of the Bayshore Bike Way. We're focusing on coastal resilience and nature based solutions. And Megan, there you are. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon, members of the Shoreline Preservation Working Group, members of the public. Uh, thank you for providing us with this opportunity today to discuss the Bayshore Bike and Resiliency Project. Uh, my name is Megan Openshaw. I'm a senior planner with the city of Imperial Beach. I'm joined today by Chris Palmer, who's our environmental and natural resources director, as well as our coastal engineer from GHD, Brian Lipson. That we can uh, go to the next slide and start on the project. So the project is taking the existing San Diego Bay Tour Bikeway corridor, and we're looking to retrofit that and create a coastal resilience corridor that has multiple benefits. And it's a 1.2 mile segment of the existing bikeway. Now, whenever I talk about this project, I always like to focus and emphasize the multiple benefit aspect of it. So in addition to not just providing flood protection to the existing bikeway, it'll also provide flood protection to the adjacent vulnerable community. Um, in addition to that, it'll improve and enhance coastal access, and then it'll also provide transitional habitat. So it focuses on ecosystem resilience by incorporating living levees, essentially all along this portion of the project into the bayfront. Now, we've done a lot of constructive uh, outreach with our community and with the existing bike path. And with that, we're really looking at using this project as an opportunity for visioning of our bayfront. And so we're trying to figure out what do people want to actually see? How can we better activate our bayfront in a way that really focuses on sustainable economic and recreational development? Next slide, please. So this is a phased project. Our first phase is our con uh, concept phase. So this has been the development of our true percent concept plans. Essentially, we were funded by OPC, and we were able to de determine that this project would be cost-effective and feasible as it was proposed with our different options that we have. Our next phase will be uh, the completing of the project plan. So that's the 100% plan that includes permitting as well as our environmental documents being completed. And then the third phase of the project is the construction of it. So that's building it, making it happen. So we did already uh, receive an award for a FEMA brick grant fund, and that's for $15.2 million. And that's going to be funding a portion of our permitting as well as basically phase two and a big chunk of phase three. So for phase two, we're also looking into uh, OPC grants as well, and you should be hearing back in the next couple of weeks or so, so fingers crossed. And then we're also keeping an eye out for other funding opportunities to finish the construction of the project. Next slide, please. So when I think about where the project is located, this is actually a multi-jurisdictional project. So even though this is only focusing on a 1.2 mile segment of the Bayshore Bikeway, it's actually touching a lot of different agencies. Those are at the local level, federal level, state level. It includes the city of San Diego, city of Imperial Beach, 
city of Coronado. And then there's also some areas that uh, with the Port of San Diego, but they're leased to Fifth and Wildlife. And there's also the Coastal Commission that's involved. So a lot of different areas that are involved in this project location. So that's why we're really looking at this as a project that will be a flagship project. That'll be really focused on how do we work with other jurisdictions and make it so that we're more successful in terms of regional adaptation projects. And then what I also like to focus on is that the Bayside neighborhood is actually a very vulnerable part of our community. And that's an area that we're focusing on protecting with this project. And that's essentially, if you're not familiar with Imperial Beach, if you look at this uh, photo here, there's that roadway, it's Palm Avenue, SO75. Everywhere north of that is our Bayside neighborhood. All right, next slide, please. So in terms of what we're looking at addressing is that flood protection, which I talked about, but are also looking in the future for sea level rise impacts or flooding impacts. So what you're looking at at this image here is that the lightest color of blue, those are the areas that you see flooding today, just existing. Then as you get darker blue, that's as sea level rises, that's the flooding impacts that would occur to that Bayside neighborhood. Should we do you know, implementation of any sort of adaptation or mitigation measures? To address sea level rise. And what I like to focus on here is that if you see there's a light green, and sorry if the lighting makes it a little hard to see, but there's a light green line that you'll see going through our Bayside neighborhood. And that is basically our existing storm drains, which you can see with even 3.26 feet of sea level rise would be completely flooded. Uh, next slide, please. And so here are some images and examples of what kind of flooding we already see today. So the, the best image really that illustrates that is if you're looking at the top left-hand corner, that's a portion of the bike path, which is completely flooded during our seasonal clean segments. And so right now what we try to do as sort of a near-term mitigation measure is we put little sandbags if we're aware of any sort of flooding impacts that may occur. But of course, that's not something that we can really look at as a long-term sort of way to address these kinds of issues. Next slide, please. So in terms of the project extent, it's that 1.2 mile segment that I discussed. So initially when we were doing this project, we started with the constraints and opportunities analysis. And what we found is that most of the impacts for the project were really focused in the Bayside neighborhood, basically to the point where you get to at around 10th Street. So that's where we, how we determine where the project uh, extent would actually be. But as I mentioned, this is a visioning project as well for the entire Bayfront. So even though you're not seeing the other portions of the Bayfront essentially that are adjacent to Imperial Beach all the way to 13th Street, we're still including that in terms of our visioning and planning for this project. But for this, um, a, a good point to point out here is that segment three, that's actually our existing Bayside Elementary School. During some of those seasonal flooding, we do see flooding even in that elementary school and it makes it unusable for the kids that actually attend that school. And so what we're looking to do is see this as an opportunity to say, We'll incorporate a multi-purpose detention basin so that way we can have more effective capture of stormwater. But in addition to that, we're also looking to make this a joint use park. So we're actually talking with our school districts right now to try and figure out a way, how can we provide this area as an open space and recreational opportunity for our community, especially in this area that needs that opportunity. And then in addition to that, as I've mentioned, we've done a lot of engagement and outreach with our community. And a lot of what we've heard in terms of concerns have been related to the safety of the bike path. So we're actually separating out that bike path to be for both pedestrians and cyclists, especially because uh, now we're seeing more e-bikes along the bike path and they get to be very fast. And so there's a lot of concerns around that. And then with that, um, oh, I one of the items, living shoreline, we're having a living levee basically on all portions of that. Bike path. And with that, uh, I will pass it over to Brian. Thanks, and hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to be going over the major engineering components of the project, and then we go into the alternatives that we're considering within our project. The major project element is this living or horizontal levy. This is a uh, like a traditional levy, though it brings in kind of multiple benefits. It kind of gives space for habitat to transgress over time as water levels rise or sea levels rise. In our situation, it's a salt marsh. So we have our, our gradient of salt marsh that can go up this shallow slope over time as water levels increase. There's a number of these projects in development in the state of California. I think there's two that have been constructed in the Bay Area, but I think this is the first in San Diego to. Um, to be in the planning phase. Next slide, please. Thanks. 
Okay. So the Lynn levy um, and its benefits, it's gonna solve a lot of flooding problems in this area of the Bayside. It's hard to see, either, but the area <clears throat> encircled by red, uh, which looks kind of like a gray, is areas that would be removed from the flood from the future floodplain. So the levee, by adding this elevation, we drop those areas from the floodplain, which is great. So we're going to design it to accommodate three and a half feet of sea level rise, but then think about future scenarios of sea level rise and use that corridor to um, phase in other elements if you give us up to six feet of sea level rise accommodation. Unresolved with our project um, with, within the levee um, is some of these issues that, that Megan was speaking to around stormwater. We have um, tides back up into the stormwater infrastructure system, inundate the system which causes two problems. They weren't designed for tides to be within those, those storm drains. So there's when it rains, there's nowhere for that water to go. Um, that's the major, major problem. Then you have the nuisance flooding, which they we talk about a lot in places like Miami, where you have the sunny day flooding, where it just starts bubbling up within the stormwater catchments. Next slide, please. So this graphic I liked, but it doesn't show up squat on this, but the slide will help. Um, it basically just describes um, in a cartoon how this this kind of other pathway for water to get beyond the levee, what's shown as our kind of a cross section of our project where we have a levee and a community behind it and an underground pathway where the, the tides make it um, under, underneath the levee and bubble up within the community. So we have that situation at the Bayside Elementary School and we need to address that within this project. Next slide, please. Um, luckily, that's pretty easily addressed with a tide gate. Um, these systems, for those not familiar, let just water go one way and keep water from coming the way you don't want it, which is the tidal water backing up within the storm drain system. So within our living levy footprint, we have a, a tide gate proposed to, to help solve this problem in the Bayside community. Next slide. Um, that gets us most of the way there, but there's still a stormwater capacity issue within this area. Um, it's a very flat and low community, as, as you all know. Um, so when it rains and when it rains hard, there's not enough capacity within the stormwater infrastructure. So we needed to add another element, which is this multi-purpose detention basin to help bring more capacity into the stormwater system. Um, this is very much like Cottonwood Creek Park in Encinitas or um, these other systems that you see were just a, a a recreational field is, is lower in grade. When it floods and it floods um, heavy, it fills in with water and then it dries up when, uh, when tides recede and, and water can uh, convey out. So the idea is to get to daylight the existing stormwater um, storm drain and um, make this kind of joint use part for the community. Next slide. So now I'm gonna step through the alternatives. Um, the it's really difficult to see, I apologize, but um, to set the stage for um, the alternatives, most of them vary in the Western Reach, which we call segment one. This is between Ponce 10 and Ponce 10A within, within, the, within the bay. And um, Ponce 10A is a heavily muted system, the salt marsh area, but it's muted. So the tidal waters don't make it back there like they should. They would have a, a large tidal range, and we'd have like a, a, very, a smaller one within 10A. So that's to explain the beauty concept to you. So um, alternative one would leave that muting in place and just elevate the bikeway as it stands, bring the elevation that we need to provide that flood protection for future sea level rise. Um, next slide, please. Alternative three would remove that existing bisection of um, Ponce 10 and 10A, this is between here, and bring people around the perimeter of Ponce 10A. The benefit there is that we could completely restore the existing bikeway prism, this area here, add new tidal connection to Ponce 10A, and um, do all the other things that we hope to do with um, flood protection. So those are kind of the two kind of bookends of our, our project. Alternative two is kind of a, a compromise where we heard from the community and stakeholder groups they really liked the bikeway on its current alignment for a lot of reasons. It was kind of an experience with, with nature of going through um, these ponds. So this option brings in an existing alignment of the bikeway uh, raised boardwalk or bridge situation similar to this one in Big Bear 
but it could be anything. It could be a, a class in covenant class one or just be pedestrian. But should um, funding become available, uh, we could bring in that, that element and re still restore those um, salt marsh areas and bring in a new tile channel. Next slide, please. So the preferred option in the feasibility study that will be coming out soon, and I should be working on right now, will be alternative three, which is the remove and reroute um, the bikeway around Pond 10A. This came out on top because of the ecosystem services that really gave a large ecological lift to this the Pond 10A by removing the, the tile muting and also providing that continuous um, restoration and kind of like it's almost like giving that area back to the bay. Um, it's also a lower cost, and then we don't have to create that boardwalk, which is actually a really expensive feature. Um, the trade off, of course, is that user experience where um, the stakeholders really like that experience. Um, if, if funding should not become an issue, or the, within our multi criteria analysis that was weighted lower, um, alternative two could still become a favorable alternative. Thank you so much, Brian. Yes. My name is Chris Homer. Uh, I'm the natural resources director here for the city. I'll, I'll kind of wrap up the, to this piece here. A big part of this whole project was outreach to the public, outreach with the agency partners, kind of what we're doing here. We've done over 30 public outreach events within our community. If you guys haven't biked around the Bayshore Bikeway, you guys really should check it out. Things are changing quite a bit around there. Um, the feedback we received from our outreach events, I mean, we haven't received any um, insurmountable object objections to uh, doing a seal rise adaptation project along Imperial Beach, opening up recreational activities and mitigating some of the flooding that's in some of our lowest income communities and most underserved communities here in the Bayside neighborhood. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So one, one of the big uh, feedback we did here is like, there's a lot of concern about safety, uh, biking speeds, the volume uh, of, increased volume of people using the bike path and the e-bikes. So one of the new section of the bike path that's actually being built as part of the children's Bayfront development, this is right by the Sweetwater bike path there, um, is they're already building wider paths with separated pedestrian areas that integrate paths within native vegetation. This has already happened down in the South Bay, and we're actually just looking really to repl replicate some of these projects that are happening along our section of you know, the south end of San Diego Bay. Um, this is gonna help us with the ease of permitting. It's already what the public really wants to have here in regards to uh, enhancing safety and enhancing user experience on the bike path. So um, this is really kind of, I mean, if you want to see what the future vision is going to be like for the whole Bayshore bikeway, see what they're building in Trula Vista right now. And that's kind of what we're looking to incorporate some of the designs here. Uh, next slide, please. And then lastly, like one of the things that we're hearing quite a bit is the public wants places to stop and appreciate the view. For so many years, that south end of San Diego Bay, it was a dump yard. I mean, our, our public works yard is right there, and we have no windows that overlook the bay. It was never thought of being an asset. Okay. But now the public wants to have places to visit, places to sit and enjoy the view as you look north of Coronado Bridge and the skyline of downtown San Diego. It, it's really spectacular. So it's going to be a new amenity. And pairing that up with the visioning that we're doing in our city about how do you create this as a destination? How is it going to be a large linear park? along the south end of San Diego Bay, and how you open up access and recreation and provide the need of flood protection and um, adaptation to, to at least three and a half feet of civil ride on for the south end of San Diego Bay. And, and that's what we're trying to achieve here in this project. And then we'll wrap it up with the end of the slide here. And then like, this, as, as among staff, we're like, we're super excited about um, opportunities here. This is a forgotten part, forgotten about part of South End of San Diego Bay. It's an area that's underutilized even within Imperial Beach. And we see this as a new opportunity to enhance recreation and to really solve a, a we've had flooding in down in that neighborhood for many, many years. Like that. we want to solve the existing flooding stuff and be more resilient to see sea level rise and do it in a way that enhances all the habitat and what in South San Diego Bay. I'll just end it there and turn it back over to you, Chair. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Chris, Brian, and, and Megan. Really great presentation of work. Really appreciate it. Um, do we have any public comments on that? Questions? I have no public comments on Questions from Jeff? Yeah, right. But what an awesome project. I can't wait until it's done and to go ride bikes down there. Um, great presentation, too. I had a question about the stormwater capacity solution with the detention basin. So the water that will find its way in there, how does it find its way out when the tide recedes? I assume it just goes down, but there are maybe times when you've got a bunch of stormwater that um, 
you know, sort of just go back out to the ocean? Is it treated? Do you use it for something? Yeah, it's, it's exactly. I mean, that, that's why we have engineers. So it's an engineering challenge, I find. But as it's low tide, you open up the tidal tide gates and the water can recede. At some point, I keep telling Brian that we're going to have to have some type of scale water pump station there. Um, but uh, um, as of now, I, I think engineering works, right? Or you have. Yeah, well, the primary design objective is 3.5 feet of lower rise, and it still works for that. I think as we get into the, the higher rates at six, that you're going to start to have. Uh, more significant issues and maybe pump stations are needed. But um, but yeah, as a out of water recede, you have that gradient again and water can you have that pressure builds up and the water can go. Yeah. Other questions and comments? Yeah. Um, oh go ahead. 100 agree with Councilor in the awesome project and really cool to get this presentation. Um I had two quick questions. One was you pre uh, presented kind of funding um, what you've got so far in the funding it looks like you're like I'm, i guess my question is do you know once if the preferred alternative is chosen like do you know have an estimate as like how much the total cost is going to be and then where you think you might get the funding from <laughs> Twenty-five million. Twenty-five, something like that. Around, because they're about like seven or eight million short. Compared to the funding we've already gotten awarded, we have high levels of confidence. There are other grant opportunities that we're keeping an eye out on there for, but I mean, outside of the OPC grant that we recently submitted an application for, we don't have anything solidly in place. Um, but yeah, we're basically just keeping out an eye. More money will. Build a more awesome park. Yeah. In the daytime, and then we'll do a better enhancement as we go over. So we'll see. Well, and then second thing, really quickly, I just I really thought the description of the living levees was cool and remind me of you know other living shoreline projects. Um, is are those going to be created just through grading, um, or like are they going to be, you know, boulders or you know what's going to be what's going to create that? What are you going to rate those topics? I guess. Yeah, they're earthen, so you'll have the the levee will be like. We'll have a traditional kind of base and core, like do technically and, and sound and all that, but the, the, the slope will be just earth and grade. Hope to have a balanced report situation within the project, but it's not a guarantee that we might need to build. Oh, so oh, this high gate is that uh, that's an automatic as opposed to someone else manually going to be it based on the water pressure that we're sitting at. Yeah, it would have to be, or our guys couldn't go out there and pull it. So it'd have to be some kind of an automated system. The engineering detail will come there. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Don't forget that. Um, the, you talked about the two of the front in the Bayshore Bikeway that's uh, three quarter mile space and 50 pounds, and you have separated. Some areas are joined with bikers and walkers, but some areas are separated, and we will be continuing that. Um, when the Rita Hotel goes in and Harbor Park gets developed. So, um, State Parks helped fund that um, project that they showed my list for those people. And then, so that was a comment. And then my last statement is um, uh, Coastal Controversy now has um, grant, a rolling grant fund out for stuff like this. You might want to check out. Any other questions? Any other questions, comments? Quick comment. Yeah, go ahead. I love this. This area in our community certainly deserves it. I wish and hope that it'll succeed and we'll be able to do it elsewhere. In Del Mar, we're studying a living levee along the San Diego River. It's in the preliminary phases. So we'll be very interested in how this works out down through the years. So thank you. Yeah, no, I just want to comment. I'm, I'm a little biased, but if you, if you haven't seen the work that's been done in South San Diego Bay, it's actually, again, only give the port credit, Fish and Wildlife Service, CYD San Diego, you know, Coastal Commission, Coastal Conservancy, really, you know, you look at the Navy with a with billion dollars spent on the, the Navy SEAL training base, um, the city of Coronado, really interesting, innovative work um, that's gone on, sort of like a living laboratory, not unlike Cardiff, right, that actually been really successful. The economic development and equity piece has been really critical because we took over the redevelopment money, we took over some warehouses in Novo, Brazil, just opened a, a brewery there, we've got rad bikes there, um, a little coffee shop in an area that was really underserved where poverty rates at the eastern end of it are 30 percent for kids right like these are kids that didn't have that when i was a kid we didn't have it was a junkyard right 
So it's been really, really great to see this real lens where you can have it all. It's really adding the equity lens. It's really quadruple win because it's economic, you know, access, you know, ecological, and then we have the equity piece, right? So, you know, congratulations. And I, I really love the marriage. I think we're all seeing this, the brilliance of landscape design, like brilliant landscape design that incorporates these elements with the engineering piece is really cool. And then obviously the, the equity piece, right? Understanding that we can turn a, a, a schoolyard that floods into a public park um, is, is really cool. And, and you see it, it's like Fish and Wildlife Service did restoration there. The minute they did it, the birds showed up like literally the next day. And the same thing with it, when we started proving that facial bikeway, and in Del Mar and San Diego has been brilliant as well. Um, it's just crazy how many people use that from every segment of society, you know, from moms to strollers and grandmas and dads to strollers to, you know, the Navy SEALs riding their bikes and then much cases on their e-bikes now. But um, but it, it, it's really, really great work. But I also want to acknowledge the port with Pond 20 also, again, is going to be super, super cool stuff. So I okay, thank you guys for doing that. Well, we know acting requires stuff for me to keep talking about how great it is. And then now more cool stuff from the port. And before we start, I just want to say that having worked as a conservationist with the port for a long time, I just want to really acknowledge that the kind of stuff that we're seeing out of the innovation lab at the port is really cool. Like it's really been exciting to see all the different ideas are just splatting at the wall. It's actually doing. So this is part of that. Anything with blue carbon in it is super cool so uh really really pleased to have um the port talk about the field graph blue carbon initiative from the port of San Diego. So. thank you so much um hello everyone my name is heather Kramlitz. i'm a specialist with the port of environmental conservation department i'm really excited to present you today i really appreciate the opportunity to share our work with you i'm also going to present with my colleague walden he'll uh, jump in um only about halfway through um but I think you're all mostly familiar with the port um, as stewards of the tidelands of historic pollution, protecting infrastructure, public access, really important aspects of our role. So uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about a study that the Port and U.S. Maritime Administration has been collaborating on for the last uh, year, which is exploring the role of San Diego Bay's eelgrass habitats, which are very important coastal habitats and uh, the role they play in sequestering and storing uh, carbon. Um, uh, specifically with Mara, they were very interested in how uh, real gravity can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're also interested in that as well, but also all of the cool benefits that come with uh, protecting and protecting ingress. So next one, please. Um, so first, let's go over what the carbon is. So, um, so it's a little faded out, but um, I'll explain the process for you. So coastal ecosystems like those found in and around San Diego Bay and along the coast of uh, San Diego have specific traits that make them very good at capturing and storing carbon. So in the infographic on the left, you can see some wetland plants, like the eelgrass in the water. Um, and these plants live the same way that a tree on land would live. Um, so they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, then they break that molecule apart, they use the carbon to build their tissues, their leaves, their stems, their roots, and then they release that um, oxygen molecule back into the atmosphere. Um, so uh, this is very similar for plants that uh, are underwater, they do the same process and they release the oxygen back into the water. But there's a difference uh, between coastal and terrestrial plants for when those plants die. So on land, a tree might live on average roughly three, three to 400 years. Um, and then uh, at, during that time, the carbon in its tissues are sequestered there. Um, so there's, there's no release back into the atmosphere. When that tree dies though, there are anaerobic bacteria, um, I'm sorry, aerobic bacteria that pull oxygen from the atmosphere. They combine it with that organic carbon, they create carbon dioxide again, they get to release back into the atmosphere. So you can think with a forest on land, uh, that carbon is sequestered for you know roughly 500 years, depending on the species and the quality of the plants. Um, in in coastal ecosystems, though, those plants are almost always submerged in water, though, and there's much less water in, or there's much much less oxygen in the water than there is um, in the atmosphere. So it delays that uh, CO2 production process. You have anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that don't use oxygen, and other processes 
that take that dead plant, break it down into little bits of organic carbon, it gets buried in the sediment, more sediment gets buried on top of it. And over time, you end up with these really organic carbon rich sediments that can sequester part of that carbon for hundreds to hundreds of thousands of years, as long as that ecosystem is maintained. Um, so in the graph on the right, you can see that coastal ecosystems can sequester carbon at rates that are much higher than terrestrial forests. So even though coastal ecosystems only make up roughly 1% of all ecosystems on the planet, they have a disproportionately greater ability to store carbon. And it's not <clears throat> Um, so how does blue carbon get into the port? First, carbon um, sequestration is uh, included in all of the port's habitat and uh, habitat conservation and restoration projects uh, because these projects are all within blue carbon ecosystems. So it's really a, a bonus benefit that we get from protecting the shoreline. Um, the port is also developing uh, seaweed and uh, shellfish aquaculture efforts, and both seaweeds and shellfish have the potential to uh, store or enhance carbon storage. Uh, so we're interested in carbon sequestration and as an added benefit for those projects. Um, blue carbon also aligns with the port's emission reduction efforts, so including our maritime clean air strategy and our climate action plan, and it supports climate resiliency. So blue carbon ecosystems don't only store carbon, but they protect shorelines from sea level rise, they can buffer against storm surge, um, they improve water quality, they provide habitat. So there are multiple co benefits of these systems. And lastly, um, blue carbon is a hot topic legislatively right now. And so the port has been tracking uh, policy efforts closely, including potential development of blue carbon offset and current markets. Next slide. So before I get into the study, I'd like to show you why we focus on eelgrass in San Diego Bay for this research. Um, the port and the Navy jointly map eelgrass in the Bay every few years. And as of 2020, we have about 2,600 acres of eelgrass in the Bay. That is about 50% of all eelgrass habitat in Southern California and about 17% of the entire state. So it's not an insignificant amount of um, eelgrass. So on the map on the right, that is San Diego Bay. Um, but fortunately, you can see the eelgrass uh, parts of it. So it's that green color. And I just want to point out this circle at the bottom that is South San Diego Bay. Um, and that's where the majority of the Bay's eelgrass habitat is located. Uh, so keep that area in mind as we go through the results in a little bit. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'll now launch into the study. Um, this idea was uh, originally developed back in 2019 with the uh, uh, nonprofit organization Wild Coast and our biological consultant ESA. And then in 2021, the U.S. Maritime Administration reached out to the port specifically looking for carbon sequestration projects um, that it could support. So we recommended this study. And we wanted to determine, um, are the are the bay eelgrass habitats storing carbon? A uh, review of the scientific literature suggests they should be, uh, but that can vary a lot based on geographic location and oceanographic conditions. So you really have to sample um, at specific, in specific locations to determine if that's happening or not. So we wanted to answer that question. And then we also wanted to know um, if there are carbon storage hotspots in the bay. Um, and we specifically sampled within <laughs> historic eelgrass sites. These are uh, eelgrass beds that have been present for several decades and in newly restored areas, areas that have been restored within the last 10 years or so. And we wanted to see the difference in carbon storage between the two. Um, lastly, we assessed uh, sea level rise and how it might influence part of the distribution of eelgrass and carbon storage into the future. Next slide, please. So what did we do? Um, we began sampling in November 2021, and we collected 100 eelgrass samples um, to test for their biomass and carbon content. And we refer to this as above ground storage. So this is storage, uh, carbon stored within the eelgrass plants themselves. And we also collected 33 sediment cores, um, and this will be referred to as below ground store, uh, storage. This is all that carbon that's uh, sequestered in the sediment of the eelgrass grows in. And we sampled at 11 locations in the uh, Bay's five ecoregions. So that is the Outer Bay, North Bay, North Central, South Central, and South Bay. And then we also sampled um, the two different species of eelgrass that are present in the Bay. So two native species, uh, Zostra Pacifica, which is found um, outside the mouth of the Bay, and then uh, Zostra Marina, which is uh, the most common eelgrass species that we have. And it's found inside the Bay, outside the Bay, 
um, everywhere. It's the most prevalent species we have. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Walden, and he can talk about the Awesome. Thanks, Heather. All right. If you want to go to the next slide, I'm just getting some of the key findings. Um, so uh, for the study, uh, we did a few sediment cores that are taken to about uh, one meter depth or to refusal, essentially where cores uh, can't go any deeper. Um, and uh, we had one core per eco region of the bay, so outside of the bay and then north, north central, south central, south. Um, and and uh, older sites, as we saw, site F and J actually had significantly greater amounts of carbon in the soils than younger sites. Um, this actually does reveal that older beds do in fact store more carbon. Uh, the following sampling sites represent uh, the Zostra marina, marina species. Uh, the Gulf and Pacifica beds uh, are actually down outside of the bay and had lower sediment carbon storage despite the plant's uh, overall larger biomass. Uh, this might be due to a few non biological factors, uh, including greater wave energy uh, and potential tidal export uh, away from the sampling sites, which could cause more carbon to uh, move out of place. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, so the Port and Navy actually alternate uh, eelgrass surveys every three to five years. Um, as we can see, uh, eelgrass uh, occurrence fluctuates over the years based on a variety of factors, um, such as available nutrients, uh, water temperatures, uh, available nutrients, dissolved CO2, et cetera. Uh, but there is actually a trend of increased assimilation uh, due to the expansion of habitat. Um, so this graph represents assimilation rates uh, from productivity sampling over time within the bay. Uh, assimilation is calculated by measuring the growth of the shoots uh, in square meter uh, meter sample area over the 12 day sampling period, um, and then this is multiplied by uh, the total eelgrass carbon content for the area. Um, <clears throat> note that we do need to do more sampling to determine uh, carbon assimilation versus sequestration, i.e. what's taken into the biomass through the productivity, which is what this graph represents, um, and what's actually buried into the sediment, which is Going to be our goal for next our uh, next year of study. Uh, so next slide. Cool. So as you can see, uh, most carbon storage does occur in the South Bay, uh, and carbon stored in the top uh, one meter of sediment is actually several uh, orders of magnitude higher than the carbon stored above ground. And that's kind of tough to see on this, but um, essentially the above ground biomass represents only about 100 to 200 uh, metric tons of carbon equivalent, where you know these are in the tens of thousands to a million. Um, in the below ground. So, so, uh, so it also um, the outer bay sites, uh, essentially the where Zosso Pacifica were, actually show the greatest biomass um, and above ground carbon content. Um, and the top one meter of sediment, as we can see, stores about 56 to 90 percent of the total carbon. Um, the total below ground carbon pool, i.e., for the, the cores that are below one meter, um, could actually be um, as large as almost uh, two and a half. Uh, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And let's, next slide. So um, a part of this analysis, as we said, we also did the sea level rise analysis just to understand the distribution of eelgrass over time. So eelgrass is actually most likely to occur between about uh, minus six and a half to about four half foot below sea level. Um, and Zostra Pacifica eelgrass in the mouth of the bay actually accounts for the deeper, uh, where Zostra uh, marina, again, on the inside of the bay is generally found more shallow areas. Um, so ESA used the ports, uh, our consultants uh, used the ports uh, medium and long-term projections uh, for, sea, for sea level rise based on OPC guidance. Um, and the graph on the left actually represents the 50th percentile, so we're looking at about 2.6 feet sea level rise. Uh, by the end of the century, and the right represents um, nearly five, four and a half uh, feet of sea level rise uh, by the end of the century. Um, and since the variation in eelgrass does uh, not, not correspond entirely with elevations, um, you know, the model should be considered approximate um, representation. Uh, eelgrass loss is not coordinated firmly. And, you know, as we see by this um, graph or this data, um, eelgrass is actually going to be kind of uh, losing largely in the middle of the bay, kind of where the purple is, if you can kind of see. And then eelgrass is actually going to be modeled to expand um, up to the Sweetwater Channel as well as the Otai River um, as well. So, yeah. So, um, and again, this model actually does not is strictly on elevation; it does not account for any other biological factors. Um, such a decretion. Um, so again, just for elevation, we can see that you know by the end of the century, we're looking to 
lose about 114 to upwards of 310 acres or hectares of field grass, really depending on sea level rise. Um, so next slide. So just kind of wrap up the key findings for this. Um, as we can see, San Diego Bay's field grass beds actually contain about uh, 1.7 million metric tons of CO2 uh, equivalent. And there could actually be an additional 100,000, potentially a million metric tons of CO2 uh, beneath that one meter, uh, which is something we're going to continue to investigate. Um, the second is carbon content in eugrass above ground is actually slightly lower uh, than expected. This could be due to the reduced nutrient loads in the bay, um, which caused much of the seagrass to be actually diminutive, so smaller than uh, compared to the literature. Um, and it is believed, like one prediction is that uh, increasing yield, uh, water clarity actually comes at the price of nutrient reduction. Um, so that's something we're going to look at in the future. And then number three, restored eelgrass beds definitely show a significant ability to store carbon. Um, you know, based on the large amount of carbon correlated to the aged bed. Uh, and then finally, based on modeling, the eelgrass habitats are expected to remove uh, between about 50, 60, 51,000 to about uh, 210,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent uh, by 2100. And this is even though, and this is factored even with the potential sea level rise and loss of habitat. Um, and this is the equivalent of about 45,000 vehicles off the road for about a year. Um, next slide. Yeah, and so just to get into the second year, our partners at MARAD um, actually funded a second year study, which we're going to be partnering with the Navy to expand sample sites. Um, we're also going to be focused on really building this carbon budget to understand how uh, carbon moves in and out of the ecosystem out of the bay. And then in order to understand the difference between assimilation and sequestration that I was talking about earlier, um, we need to explore the rates of detrital export, essentially the biomass leaving the, the EORS beds. Um, as well as uh, the suspension of bicarbonate ions in the water column. Um, and also we're going to use sediment core carbon dating actually to develop an age versus depth profile. So this, along with the coil, uh, soil carbon sampling from this year's study, um, will help us better understand you know, sedimentation rates build up and carbon bale barrel rates, which will ultimately give us uh, an idea of sequestration of the events. Uh, and then finally, so we're also going to do uh, a grain size analysis and nutrient deficiency study. So as we were saying before, uh, there's actually low productivity for Zofka Marina within the bay, uh, which could be due to a lack of nutrients. Um, and we're also going to determine the relationship between uh, biomass, nutrient deficiency, and grain size, essentially see which uh, grain sizes within the benthic environment hold, trap better carbon, um, et cetera. And uh, yeah, this is actually starting to kick off now. We're starting to do some sampling. Um, we're expected to have this report second year of the study by August of 2023. Um, next slide. I think uh, I think I'll turn it back over to Heather just to wrap it up and kind of talk about next steps and policy implications. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Walden. Um, so I just want to highlight some of the broader impacts the study uh, the city is uh, likely to have. Hopefully, um, first, uh, carbon storage in eelgrass systems could be a useful greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy um, for the port and the urban uh, in general. Um, there's a lot of buzz right now about developing the carbon credit um, methodologies and <laughs> credit standards and um, offsetting those projects. Uh, those are a little bit amorphous right now, but we've been tracking that and opportunities to potentially, uh, in the future, potentially do an eelgrass uh, pilot offset project. Um, and there's also been a lot of focus on resiliency credits, and these are credits that take into account all of the uh, ecosystem services that habitat might provide. So not just blue carbon itself, but also um, endangered species or sea level rise or habitat restoration to sort of uh, bolster the value of those credits in general, because eelgrass and other uh, coastal ecosystems are very expensive to restore, and you get a good credit price um, if you're going to uh, make that a uh, a viable financial option. So um, resiliency credits is also something that we're looking into. Um, our study provides some uh, much needed data, much needed data locally that can help support that. Um, if we were to pursue uh, like an offset project, you would need local data, uh, a, a local uh, long-term database, long database to be able to support that. So this is a, a great first step. Um, Blue, uh, Blue Carbon also integrates into several other initiatives the port already has underway, um, such as habitat restoration, um, 
uh, specifically right now in the Chorus Bayfront, um, our, co our coastal wetland mitigation bank down in Pond 20. Um, that is a huge benefit that that site will have is carbon, uh, carbon sequestration, which we've already done some preliminary assessments of how much carbon that site is storing at the moment um, and how much it can store into the future. Um, and our living shoreline projects. Um, so uh, blue carbon is a natural component of these projects it, and we can monitor and assess that over time as long as we um, direct our resources there. Um, so let's see what else. So at the state level, the California Air Resources Board, oh yeah, go back to this one, um, is required to incorporate blue carbon into its national and working lands inventory. We've had conversations with CARB about this. It's a very data deficient area. They're very interested in incorporating our data into that. So we uh, have shared our data with them for um, their inventory update. Um, we're also closely following the Blue Carbon Collaborative, which is a California-based blue carbon working group, and the Pacific Northwest Blue Carbon Working Group, which is developing a West Coast-based blue carbon database um, that our data can be added to. Um, and then lastly, San Francisco Bay has been uh, uh, collecting similar data for a slightly different goal. They're creating a coastal wetland greenhouse gas inventory based on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's standards to get a really clear picture of the GHG services that San Francisco Bay provides. And we could absolutely do something similar here in San Diego Bay. So we've had um, some discussions with the Navy and other groups about uh, pursuing a GHG inventory here. Next slide, please. Um, we're almost done. If you're interested in reading the report, it is available on our website. There's a tiny URL right there that will get you to it. We've also created a a uh, two-page key findings flyer um, that sort of summarizes the takeaways of the study, which hopefully you should all have a copy of. Uh, it's also available on our website, and I'm happy to uh, share those links with you uh, if you would like them. Uh, the report is fairly technical, so I would start with a flyer and go from there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and that's it from us. I'd like to thank the Maritime Administration one more time for supporting this study. Um, it is a, a little bit of a, a out of their normal wheelhouse, but they're very excited about it. And we really appreciate that enthusiasm and they're, they're really excited about the results and how this information can be applied both regionally and with other uh, uh, maritime agencies. So um, that's really cool. And Walden and I are happy to answer any questions. Very good work. I'm obsessed with every blue carbon project all over on the planet, communicating with folks from all over the planet. This is really cutting into stuff. But brilliant work, but really, really cool stuff. So thank you guys for doing this. Um, up, up there with the Australians and folks in Washington, but it's really not being done pretty much anywhere. So this framework is a great framework for every lagoon project and you know everywhere we're working right. And when I think about sea turtles, sea turtles are here. They're in La Jolla. They're salami tabletops, right? Because they're feeding on the grass. So it's super cool stuff. So questions. I'm obviously enthusiastic about it. You want to make sure? <laughs> yeah, um, super glad that we're doing this and glad that we're able to have additional funding. And I know we were talking about how small the eel grass is in San Diego Bay and think that part of its nutrients, but I go on with the fact that I think it's we just have a much bigger turtle population in there to develop and grow. So that's that's my Questions, comments? A comment. I love this. I'm having a hard time staying in the chair. This is so exciting. And I wanted to share one of the things I'm working on in my city of Del Mar. We're trying to figure out how to get this into the policy making process where we actually make the world better using this kind of information. So, what we did is, as you all know, CEQA has guidelines, but CEQA also allows you to adopt local guidelines just for your city so long as they're consistent with the state guidelines. So we're working on a draft local CEQA guidelines that would include identifying blue carbon as an item that you on the checklist, you know, are there endangered lizards or this so or that? One would be, is there blue carbon either current that's wet or historic that's uh, dried out wetlands? And if so, then that would trigger an obligation to study it and trigger an obligation to mitigate it. Uh, and I'd just be curious, what do you think that's a, are we too early for that, or is that a good strategy? I don't think you're too early for it. Um, and I foresee, uh, I foresee blue carbon being incorporated more um, into CEQA. I mean, I believe there was already a bill, but I don't think it got very far um, with the Coastal Commission. Um, to incorporate blue carbon into any coastal project. So um, there's 
copies of it at the state level. Um, it, it's, a, it's a really hot topic right now, and people are, are really willing to support it, except for the research. Um, I think the blue carbon market is sort of driving this, and you know, the intention to use sell credit to make money off of it, um, I think is a, a bit of a driving factor. But I think it's also good at the state level, like they, they realize, like CARB realizes that this is a very important topic, and they realize that they're behind uh behind the curve on getting data for this and incorporating it and so they're getting a lot of push to do that and i, I, I don't think you're ahead of them. i think you're right on track that's great news and in the meantime if we could do this at the local city level without having to leave the state why not yeah um yeah that's that was an outstanding presentation so fascinating um and i wanted to comment that it was very helpful for you to use the metric of ghgs and how it translates to trips because i think a lot of us here have to think about vehicle miles traveled so giving us that equivalent to understand exactly what the reduction is is really helpful all right great, great. Right. Such a great presentation. The building method is going to be reintroduced next week. So thank you. Um, and I'm wondering how this study can be used to really avoid no net loss. So looking at projecting net loss because of the sea level rise, but how can we also use this data to encourage in terms of organizations that are doing bayfront projects um, to reduce the loss of the seagrass? That's a great question. So uh eel, eel grass is already a protected species so uh, you know under NOAA's already eel grass mitigation policy uh, it, it's a forward to do a development project you would absolutely have to mitigate for eel grass but uh taking into sort of the natural processes of sea level rise uh there's no law right now that says you know if sea level rise is a foot we lose 100 acres of eel grass but we have to restore that um but we, I think, focusing on all the co benefits that the provides. Um, I think if you can develop a blue carbon credit project, uh, a methodology that incentivizes restoration, that's probably going to be the best bet. Um, the the barrier that we keep running into at the port, I would say, is that coastal restoration is so expensive, and right now grants opportunities. The amount of funding they provide don't really align with how much it actually costs to uh, design and construct a habitat restoration project. So, but we've been seeing from the state that there is, like, I think they understand that problem. There is more grant funding coming available, uh, but I think it's going to be uh, a mix of opportunities to do it and restoration. Okay, one more, one more question. So we can do questions, but yeah, we'll end. We'll wrap it up. So two two oh, question and then maybe the first a boneheaded question. Um, the re so you so you had that image that showed where eelgrass is going to be lost and where it's going to be gained and all the gains were in South Bay. Is that I, I'm just assuming? I just want to make sure that I'm assuming correctly. Is that is that just because those areas in the South Bay right now are kind of dry and they'll be built? Those yeah, they'll they'll have have so okay. The top green side really does thrive at like that lumber elevation. and the South South Bay for part of the base is much deeper, so that's going to concentrate a loss. Um, and then it's going to ideally the models not to migrate uh, up like sweetwater to gamble. So then tying into Mary's great point about how do you know that loss, this made me think of the last presentation about the Bay Shore Bikeway and how the preferred alternative is the more, the slightly more retreat one where you're kind of removing, you know, rather than building a bridge or building a wall, you're retreating a little bit. That seems like a, a way to incorporate a more, a less of a net loss because by moving back a little bit, it will create that habitat for that field rest. The more great. No, super, super great work. I, I think the real issue is the more we can integrate these, you know, multi-varied ecosystem projects that are helping us migrate. So whether it's seal graph and then salt marsh and then riparian stuff, it's going on San Diego, if you want to have the South Tampa Bay. So in other areas as well, it's really, really cutting edge and really smart. And we all know the more we spend time focused on this kind of stuff and stuff we've been talking about, rather than the flight of three houses in Del Mar or IB. Right, getting stuck in those conflicts that don't get us anywhere. Like this is really cool stuff. And I think my final comment is that again, I'm in contact with all these people doing this stuff all over, the, all, all over the planet. We need to take more ownership of the great work we're doing and really be a lot more leaderful in, in international forums to talk about what's going on in San Diego. Because whether it's beach sand replenishment and us working together or the wetland restoration and landscape design and smooth carbon stuff. It's really great work and it really requires regional cooperation, but it has global and national and global implications. So great work. That's it. Keep doing the same work and thanks, guys. Thank you.
All right, next meeting is on March 2nd and uh, meeting is done. Oh, sorry. I apologize. Two things for the record. There were no other public comments other than that one in person on that item. And um, the minutes from the previous meeting were correct with Councilmember Zito as absent or oh. present for the meeting because he attended virtually and thus was considered a member of the public. So there will be no change to the minutes. I just wanted to put that on the record. Thanks, guys.